Welcome to Time Travelling Team, the weekly podcast where we review every story of Doctor Who right from the very beginning. I'm Paddy. And I'm Trisha. Today we'll be doing things a little bit differently than we usually do. Up to now, we have reviewed one story per episode of the podcast, no matter how long or short the story was. However, Paddy and I both agreed that the 12 episodes of the Daleks Master Plan was pushing it a little bit for one podcast, and so we split the discussion in two. This week, we'll be discussing the first four episodes of the Daleks Master Plan. We will go through the story recap and trivia as normal, as well as our character discussions. However, the overall discussion will not include a score for this story. That will be saved until next week, when we'll review the remaining eight episodes. This is a new way of doing things for us, and we would really appreciate your feedback. We would also love to hear your thoughts on this first part of the Daleks Master Plan. To join the discussion, you can check us out at Time Teamp, that's T-I-M-E-T-E-A-M-P, on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram, or you can email us at timetravellingteamp at teamproductions.com. Now though, on to the story recap. Episode 1, The Nightmare Begins. Stephen is unconscious in the medical bay, and the doctor reveals to Katerina that he has developed blood poisoning due to the wound he sustained in Troy. The TARDIS begins to materialise, and the doctor tells Katerina to tend to Stephen, while he goes out to explore the area and see if he can find anything to help Stephen. Outside on the planet's surface, two members of the Space Security Service are attempting to make contact with their base, but they cannot get through. One of them is injured, and it is clear they are being pursued by someone or something. Back at the headquarters, their incoming transmission goes unnoticed, as the staff in the communications room are eagerly awaiting an announcement from Mavic Chen, the guardian of the Sol system. He is intending to take some time away from his duties and does not wish to be disturbed. He leaves a parting message to the citizens of the Sol system, commending them on maintaining the hard-fought peace they secured over 25 years ago and hopes that it will continue on for many years to come. When the announcement ends, the workers go back to their control panels, just missing the signal from the two operatives. The operatives have been dispatched to the planet Kemble, the last known whereabouts of their colleague Mark Corey, to investigate what happened to him. With no sign of help, the senior of the two operatives, Brett Vion, says that they should leave, but the wounded one, Kurt Gentry, insists that Brett should go on without him, as his wounds would only hinder their progress. Brett refuses to leave his friend behind, but Kurt pulls a gun on him and demands that he leave. Brett takes the transmitter with him and nods a silent goodbye to Kurt. After he leaves, Kurt moves off into the jungle to try to eliminate whatever it is that's hunting him. He does not get very far before he is killed by a Dalek. The Dalek is then joined by another, and they move off in pursuit of Brett. Brett is making his way through the jungle, but he trips and breaks the transmitter. He begins to despair that his last chance of rescue is gone when he hears the TARDIS materialise close by. He goes into hiding and observes as Katerina and the Doctor emerge from inside. The Doctor tells her to go back inside and look after Stephen, telling her that she can lock it after him as he has a key. After he leaves, Brett tries to enter the TARDIS and finding it securely locked, takes off after the Doctor. The Doctor pauses in a clearing and sees some sort of settlement and wonders who would have built a settlement in such a harsh environment. As he is pondering this, Brett accosts him at gunpoint and demands the TARDIS key. Inside the TARDIS, Katerina is tending to a delirious Stephen, answering all his questions about who she is and what happened to Vicky. Suddenly, the doors open and Brett enters, staring around in amazement. Katerina innocently asks if the doctor sent him, and Brett takes advantage of her naivety and says that he did and that she should shut the door immediately. Brett tries to start up the control console and accidentally turns on the scanner. He calls Katerina to help him, so neither of them notice Stephen as he sits up to look at the screen when he sees the doctor on it pacing back and forth. He then sneaks up on Brett and knocks him out before he can do anything else. Outside, the doctor is furious at the turn of events and then notices that Brett left the key in the door. As he is about to enter the TARDIS and gloat over this fact, his attention is drawn to the sound of a landing spacecraft. He decides to go in and deal with Brett before going to investigate the new arrival. Once inside, he sees Brett unconscious and uses his opportunity to place him in a specialised magnetic chair with a very powerful force field around it. He then goes to check on Katerina and Stephen, who has lapsed back into unconsciousness. He tells her about the settlement he saw, and then leaves, informing her that she is safe from Brett while he is in the chair. After he leaves, Brett inquires as to what happened to Stephen, and Katerina reluctantly says what happened. Brett makes a peace offering by saying that he has medicine that can help Stephen. Convinced that his motives are genuine, she takes the medicine and it seems to have an almost immediate effect on Stephen. Out in the jungle, the doctor makes his way through the settlement and comes across the nearly unrecognisable body of Corey on the ground. He also notices the recording beacon and decides to pocket it for a later examination. He reaches the outskirts of the settlement and is horrified to see a group of Daleks waiting at the landing platform. He also witnesses the passenger of the spacecraft emerge, revealed to be Mavic Chen, who seems to be in league with the Daleks for their plans of conquering the Sol system. He then rushes back to the TARDIS, but once he is there, he sees the doors open, 
and a squad of Daleks surrounding it. Episode 2 Day of Armageddon The patrol commander orders all other Daleks to converge on the TARDIS so that they may track down the crew and exterminate them. However, an incoming message from the Dalek Supreme informs him to instead prepare for Operation Inferno. The commander orders all Dalek patrols to retreat to their respective safety zones in order to begin the countdown. In the settlement, Mavic Chen is attending to some paperwork when a black-clad figure approaches him. He introduces himself as Zephon, ruler of the Fifth Galaxy. They discuss the new alliance between the Daleks and the forces of the outer galaxies and the plans for the conquest of the Sol system. Zephon is curious as to why Chen has joined their coalition and he informs him that he wants to control more than just one system in his galaxy. Little do they know that their conversation is secretly being listened to by the Daleks. When he is made aware of Chen's ambition, the Dalek Supreme informs his underlings that once he has served his purpose, then Chen will be disposed of along with the other members of the Alliance. In the jungle, Katarina has explained their current situation to Stephen when they are found by the Doctor. Katarina explains that Brett helped him escape, little realising that they were perfectly safe within the TARDIS. The Doctor rallies his companions, saying that they have to work to do now that they are facing the Daleks. Elsewhere in the jungle, Brett observes a squad of Daleks setting fire to it. He retreats back and encounters the others, informing them of what he has just witnessed. The Doctor says that they should go back to the TARDIS, but Stephen says that it's highly likely that the Daleks are outside it, waiting for the travellers to return. An argument breaks up between the Doctor and Stephen, but it is curtailed by Brett telling them to both shut up. He says their priority should be to warn Earth, but the Doctor insists that they need to tackle the problem here and now before the Daleks' plans advance. He tells Brett if they are so insistent on calling Earth, then it should be to request that they look up their records relating to the previous invasion during the 22nd century and learn what they can in order to defeat them. Stephen interrupts them, saying that he can smell smoke and they see that the jungle has been set aflame by the Daleks. The Doctor leads them towards the settlement, saying that it is the last place the Daleks would think to look for them. In the settlement, Chen and Zephon are discussing the nature of the Alliance, with Chen being the more realistic of the two when it comes to acknowledging where they sit in the hierarchy. They are summoned in a meeting chamber, but Zephon insists on going when he is ready, thereby showing his status among the Daleks. His absence is a cause of irritation for the Daleks, and a search party is sent to locate him. The travellers arrive at the landing port of the settlement, and Brett recognises Chen's spacecraft, and becomes incredulous at the concept of his presence among the Daleks. The others don't seem to take too much notice of this, and instead question him as to whether he can fly the vessel or not. Before another argument breaks out, the Doctor tells him to hide as he can hear something approaching. Brett and the Doctor ambush the figure who is revealed to be Zephon and render him unconscious. Brett urges them to make haste for the ship, but the Doctor says that this is the perfect opportunity to find out what the Daleks are planning. He tells the group he will disguise himself in Zephon's robes and attend the meeting whilst they go and prepare the ship. He takes Brett aside and tells him to use his own judgement on how long to wait before leaving the Doctor behind. He also gives him the beacon he found in the jungle, which Brett seems to recognise. He has revalidated his opinion of the Doctor and commends him on his bravery, but the Doctor says he is merely doing the right thing. The Dalek search party encounter the Doctor disguised as Zephon and escort him to the meeting. The others use this opportunity to make for the ship, but none of them notice Zephon regaining consciousness. In the meeting, the Dalek Supreme announces that the Time Destructor is nearing completion, a fact that garners a round of applause from the delegates. Chen is called upon to present the core of the Time Destructor, which is made from a mineral that can only be found in the Sol system. Meanwhile, the others successfully take control of Chen's ship, but moments later Zephon raises the alarm, causing the whole base to fly into a panic. The meeting devolves into chaos and the Doctor uses this as an opportunity to steal the ignition core. As he tries to get away, he is blocked by Zephon, who calls for security. On the ship, Brett follows through on the plan and, despite the pleas of the others to wait, prepares the ship for takeoff. Episode 3 Devil's Planet Brett tells Stephen that something is jamming the airlock from closing, and when he goes to investigate, he sees it as the Doctor. They get him inside and he orders Brett to take off. Once they are in orbit, the Doctor informs the others as to what he witnessed in the meeting and urges Brett to set course for Earth so that they can warn the controlling council and all the other plans of the Daleks' plans and Chen's betrayal. In the command centre of the base, the Dalek Supreme stops his men from shooting the ship down as they could destroy the ignition core for the Time Destroyer. Instead, he orders them to activate a device called a randomizer. Before they can proceed further with it though, they call all the delegates into the command centre so that they can address what happened. When he is accused of having helped the intruder steal the Terranium, Zephon turns to Chen for help, only to be left high and dry. Zephon tries to turn suspicion onto Chen by saying that he is the only one that knew about the Terranium core, but Chen retorts by asking what would it have gained by wasting the 50 years it took to have a sufficient amount mined to make the ignition core. Zephon's protests and claims are ignored by the Daleks, and when he threatens to leave with some of the other delegates, they abandon him and watch as he is executed. Once he is dead, the Dalek Supreme requests an update on the fugitive ship and he is told that they are nearing the planet Desperus. He then orders the randomizer to be activated. On Chen's ship, 
the doctor was showing the others the properties of terranium. Due to the extreme brightness of the terranium in the ignition core, they need to wear visors to observe it. Stephen insists that they need to be proactive in stopping the Daleks, but the doctor advises them that they will need to take things slow that they so they can examine all their options. He gets Brett to play the recording beacon he found in the jungle, and he reveals that he found it near a body that Brett believes to have been Mark Corey's. This is confirmed when they played the tape and hear Corey's final transmission about the plans of the Alliance. Just as the group begin to discuss their next steps, the Daleks activate the randomizer and cause the ship to veer into the gravitational field of Desperus. Brett informs the others that it is a penal world where prisoners are marooned and left to fend for themselves, and if they crash there then they will not be able to leave again. Brett tries to regain control of the ship, but unbeknownst to him, the Daleks have taken complete control of it. Chen enters the control room and when he's informed as to what is going on, offers to return to Earth to investigate and see if there is anyone aware of his treachery and eliminate them to keep the impending invasion secret. The Dalek Supreme says that he will provide a ship similar to his so as not to arouse suspicion, and he will return once his investigation is complete. He then orders the fugitive ship to be landed gently on Desperus in order to prevent damaging the terranium. This change in velocity doesn't go unnoticed by the fugitives, and they realise that the Daleks will soon be coming after them. On the planet's surface, a group of convicts are contesting over a knife to see who will be leader of their group. One of them, who is named Bors, wins again and orders the other two, Gage and Kirkson, to go about the menial tasks around the camp. During the night, Kirkson tries to take the knife from Bors, but he is caught. As they argue, they hear the sound of the landing spacecraft. Gage arrives, and he and Bors go to take a look at it before any other prisoners try to claim it. Kirkson follows on after them, refusing to be abandoned by them. On the ship, Katarina is keeping a lookout whilst the others are trying to repair the ship so they can leave. The Doctor bemoans the fact that he doesn't have access to the TARDIS and must instead rely on what he deems to be an inferior craft. He gets the hump when Stephen tr- infers that the TARDIS is less than perfect and so tells him to get back to work whilst he goes to check on Katarina. He tells her that she shouldn't have opened the airlock door whilst keeping on guard but she points out approaching lights in the distance to him. He says that they will need to protect the ship whilst the boys carry on with their repairs. The trio of convicts appear and Bors orders them to put away their lights, which Kirkson is reluctant to do so as the lights are the only thing keeping the screamer bats away. Bors puts out their lights anyway and Kirkson's terrified shrieks seem to attract the bats to him as Bors and Gage carry on through the swamp to the ship. The doctor is rigged up an electrical cable and placed it into the swamp, turning the whole thing live in order to shock anyone trying to get through it into unconsciousness. The plan works as Bors and Gage are knocked out as they draw near the ship. Before they can rejoice too much, a Dalek ship begins its descent onto the planet. Brett begins to take off, but notices that the Doctor forgot to close the airlock after retrieving the electrical cable. Thankfully, he's able to close it remotely from the control panel as they take off. Their window of escape has extended when the Dalek ship seems to land awkwardly, hampering their ability to pursue them. They allow themselves to relax, and the Doctor asks Katarina to make sure everything in the airlock is okay due to being closed mid-takeoff. However, once she goes towards it, she is immediately captured by Kirkson. Episode 4 The Traitors Stephen and the Doctor demand that Kirkson let Katarina go, but he refuses and demands that Brett take the ship to Kemble. When he is told that it is now a Dalek stronghold, he says he doesn't care and insists that they take him there. The Dalek pursuit ship messages back to the command centre and informs them of what occurred. The Dalek Supreme is told that the ship has resumed course for Earth and he orders that Chen be informed of these events so he can recover the terranium and kill the fugitives. He then orders the pursuit ship to be destroyed for its failure to capture the others. On the ship, Brett and Stephen pretend they are changing the ship's direction, but Kirkson doesn't believe them. Brett tries to convince him by telling him to look at the external view screen, and when he does so, fires a stabilizer rocket that causes the ship to lurch to one side. The resulting unbalancing causes Kirkson to fall back into the airlock, taking Katarina with him. Before they can rescue her though, Kirkson shuts the airlock door, sealing them inside. The doctor demands that he let Katarina go, stating that he would blast Kirkson into space otherwise. However, he calls the doctor's bluff when he says that he would not risk sending Katarina out into space as well. Brett refuses to change course and deviate from his mission, despite pleas and favour calling from the doctor and Stephen. Katarina, however, takes the decision out of their hands and opens the airlock from the inside, sending both herself and Kirkson to their deaths. The trio reel in shock at the loss of their friend, and Stephen suggests that it might have been an accident, but the doctor disagrees. He says that she seemed to think that she was destined to die due to her ancient beliefs and that she most likely sacrificed herself to save them and the lives of all the people in the Sol system from the Daleks invasion. He says that he will always remember her and hopes that she has found her peaceful afterlife as he mournfully watches her frozen body float off into space. Back in the Dalek command centre, Trantus, another member of the Alliance who represents the largest of the galaxies, demands to know what has been done to recover the Terranium and why the Dalek Supreme places so much trust and responsibility in Chen. He assures Trantus that Chen has been sent on an important mission and that he will not fail. 
He has pressed for more information on the inf- mission, but the Dalek Supreme insists their plan will succeed and nothing will stop them, subtly inferring that it includes all their allies. The travellers are approaching Earth, and Brett says that they cannot land on any of the public landing platforms, as they will most likely be taken into custody for arriving in Chen's ship without him. He tells the others he can take them to an experimental facility outside of the central city, and from there contact one of his colleagues for help. In his control room, Chen is being briefed on Brett's service record and appearance. He puts out an execution on site order for him and anyone travelling with him, and recalls all space security officers to assist in the manhunt. After he disbands the meeting, he tells Ch- Security Chief Carlton to remain behind, and once they are alone, shows his fear that Brett's interference could spoil the invasion plans. He admonishes Carlton for allowing Brett and Gantry to go off in the first place and search for Corey, who had gone rogue, but Carlton says that he had no choice as it would have looked suspicious if he had refused. However, he assures Chen that all future operations will need to be personally approved by him. Chen then grows furious over the loss of the Terranium as it could damage his ambitions and standing with the Daleks, as they may turn their favour over to Trantis due to his status as a representative of the largest galaxy. Carlton assures him that all will turn out as planned, as he too has a stake in the success of the invasion. He then informs Chen that he has dispatched his best agent, whose name is Sarah Kingdom, to deal with Brett, a choice that Chen approves of due to Kingdom's ruthless and rigidly obedient nature. Carlton then gets a call informing him that Chen's ship has landed at the experimental facility. Agent Kingdom arrives after a short while and reports that she witnessed Brett and the others disembark from Chen's ship. Before she leaves to capture them, Chen tells her about the Terranium, but does not make any reference to the Daleks' plan. Sarah promises to bring it back, and after she leaves, both Chen and Carlton comment on how her obedience did make her suspect them at all. At the experimental facility, the travellers are waiting for Brett's colleague, Daxter, to arrive. The Doctor and Stephen start to grow impatient, despite Brett's reassurances that Daxter can help and he states that they need to stay as they are most likely being hunted as criminals. The doctor points out that there does not appear to be any staff at the facility and it is possible that they have wandered into a trap. Daxter arrives and the trio tell them of Chen's betrayal and of the invasion force being assembled. The doctor then says that he and Stephen need to return to Kemble in order to retrieve the TARDIS. Daxter says it will be arranged along with sending out a system-wide alert to assemble a counter-invasion force. However, the doctor then asks him how much Chen is paying him to betray them. When Daxter refutes the allegation, the Doctor points out that he had asked about the Terranium, despite no one mentioning it in their story. Realising that he has been caught out, Daxter begs them to believe him, but Brett shoots him in fury over his betrayal. The Doctor gives out to Brett that his hot-headed action has now cost them their only source of information as to who they can trust on Earth. Back on Kimball, the Daleks receive a communication from Chen, stating that he has located the Terranium and will have it returned to them in two days. He also states that a preliminary investigation has revealed the fugitives are agents of the Tenth Galaxy under the command of Trantus, a fact which he denies, saying that Chen is trying to frame him. As the report cannot be confirmed, the Dalek Supreme says that once Chen returns, they will get to the bottom of the case and exterminate those responsible for the theft. Back on Earth, the trio are discussing the best way to alert the other plants about the invasion. Brett says that he can try and bluff his way into the security control room, but just as they're about to leave, Sarah arrives. Brett's initial happiness at her arrival vanishes as she holds him at gunpoint and demands to be given the Terranium. Brett distracts her and tells the Doctor and Stephen to run for it, but Sarah shoots him before he can follow them. After quickly searching his body and finding no Terranium, Sarah goes after the others and calls one of her subordinates to have all the exits sealed off so they can't escape. She also gives the order for the Doctor and Stephen to be shot on sight and for whoever finds them to aim for the head. End of part one. So now that's the story recapped, we're going to go over to Trisha for some trivia notes on part one of the Daleks Master Plan. Thanks, Paddy. So the air date for the first four episodes of the Daleks Master Plan was the 13th of November to the 4th of December 1965. Now, Paddy, this is a Dalek story. Mm-hmm. Who do you think wrote it? Um, would, I be, would it be silly to say that it's Terry Nation? I, I it would not be silly to say that it's Terry Nation because it was. These first four episodes were written by Terry Nation. Woohoo, I'm not Duh. an idiot. When Terry wrote the serial, he was actually under the impression that Vicky was still part of the main cast. And if she were, she would have been the one killed off in The Traitors and not Katarina. So like everyone knew that like Maureen O'Brien was kind of planning to leave at some point. But he didn't know that the Mythmakers had happened and how that had played out. Oh wow, that that would have been a very different impact, I think. It really would. And 
we'll get to that more in our character discussion later, but I think that would have been a very different episode. Oh. Had it, done, had it gone that way. Hugely. So, for our director, we have Douglas Campfield. We've also mentioned Douglas several times before. Of these four episodes, only episode two still exists in its entirety, like beginning to end. Though there are brief clips from the other episodes. Among the surviving clips, which, of course, this is one of the surviving clips, is the scene of Katarina's death. And the reason that clip survived is because it was shown on Blue Peter. What the fuck were they doing? (laughs) Showing that on Blue Peter. Blue Peter, if people recall, is for children. (laughs) What the hell? And it's... Yeah, like it's it only kind of goes to like a certain point. Uh, it doesn't show like the after effects of her in space. It's just there everyone's reaction to it. Yeah, but still, fuck it up. Mm. So with so many episodes missing, we again have to give our thanks to the crew over at Loose Cannon who have recreated the missing parts of the episodes. And they did a really good job. I think, particularly in the first four episodes, it's done really well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. One of the things with this story, and you know, we're going to see this as we go through, is um, this story was never screened in Australia. The Australian Broadcast Corporation judged it to be unsuitable for minors. I wonder fucking why. <laughs> Could it be that half the cast die <laughs> in the first four episodes? Yeah, like, it's just like there's a not yeah, like because you've got Zephon. And then you've got Katarina and you've got Brett. Yep. Uh, I'm sure other... Oh, and um, was it Kurt? The Brett's partner? He also does. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, it's not exactly your usual romp. And it's definitely seeing a change where... I think in previous stories... We did have a couple of stories that there was a lot of death in it. But it was death of non. I think main characters. You know yeah, I, mean? I think one of the one story that kind of leaps to mind with a kind of high kill count is obviously you've got the Dalek invasion of Earth, but yeah. in terms of kind of like smaller scale, probably the Reign of Terror when um, Jules like rescues Ian. Yeah, and I think since then I don't think we've had an episode that sort of you know has gun violence that isn't a Dalek gun which you know yeah, cause, is a whisk because like obviously in the crusade it's you know swords and sabers uh, yeah. or sorry swords and scimitars uh, with the space museum there's not a whole lot shown on screen the chase we've gone over that um, and then yeah this is like the, I think the first kind of big one where by there'd be a lot of gun violence yeah so, yeah, um, the Australian Broadcast Corporation basically said, nope, we don't want it. Thanks, but no thanks. So, moving on to our cast. So, as Brett Vian, we have Nicholas Courtney. Now, anyone who is familiar with Doctor Who in the 70s, anyone who's familiar with the legacy of Doctor Who, Nicholas Courtney will not be a new name to you. He crops up a lot. For now, though, I did want to share a few interesting things I didn't know about Nicholas Courtney. I think I knew a bit because someone bought me his autobiography at one point. Yeah, I wonder who that someone was. But I read it a very long time ago, (laughs) so (laughs) I have forgotten a lot of what's in it. So this was actually a really good refresher. So he was born in Cairo in Egypt. He was the son of a British diplomat. He was educated in France, Kenya and Egypt. So he was a well-traveled young man. Mm Mm-hmm. He served his national service in the British Army and he left after 18 months as a private because he didn't want to pursue a military career. He went to the Weber Douglas Drama School and then also did rep in Northampton before moving to London. Like I said, this is by no means Nick's last appearance in Doctor Who and we'll be discussing him in way more detail further down the line. Outside of Who, Nick has also appeared in The Indian Tales of Rudyard Kipling, The Saint, The Avengers, Softly Softly, Yes Prime Minister, and then Churchill Said to Me. A couple of our frequent flyers. (laughs) Sadly, Nick passed away back in 2011. 
Mavic Chen is played by Kevin Stoney. This is the first of three Doctor Who appearances for Kevin. The other two are The Invasion and Revenge of the Cybermen. And I will just say right now, the minute he appeared on screen, I was like, I recognise that mouth with a beard. <laughs> I did, I couldn't think of where. And then I looked this up, I was like, oh, it's Revenge of the Cybermen. That's, his mouth-beard combo is very familiar in that story. His other acting credits include Doom Watch, Space 1999, Blake 7, Spy Trap, The Caesars and I, Claudius. Hmm. Kevin passed away back in 2008. Just doubling back to Nick Courtney there, uh, for a second, would I be right in thinking that he would be the first kind of Doctor Who uh, actor that you know that we obviously knew that pa- passed away? Like, because like, obviously we've gone through like uh, like through the trivia notes, like your know, actors and guest stars that have passed away in various years, but we wouldn't have really known them until such a time as like we did the podcast. Whereas Nick, obviously, we had watched like you know him during. John's era, Tom's era, and so on. I think so, yeah, because I think in the time that we've been watching Who, yeah. Nick was the first. Yeah. Sadly, not the last. No. But we'll get to that down the line. Yeah. Nick was the first. Um, and I actually did get to meet Nick a couple of years ago, and he was absolutely lovely. Hmm. He was very, very sweet. Yeah, no, it's just like that. It's finally kind of, kind of resonating. Like, you know, you're saying these facts about someone passing away, which is unfortunate. But obviously now with someone that you know you're familiar with through con- conventions and we're both familiar with through actually watching the show for such a long time. Yeah, I think like you know we remember the day that that was announced and stuff like that. Whereas yeah. with the others we don't because we wouldn't have been following it. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think it's 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 quite different with Nick when we think about it that mm-hmm. way. So we have a new companion, or do we? I mean, <laughs> we had a new companion ish. Katarina is played by Adrienne Hill. I mentioned her briefly last week. So Adrienne trained in acting at the Bristol Old Vic. And then she spent some time with the Old Vic Company in London. She was originally invited to audition for the role of Joanna in The Crusade. Which she didn't get. But which someone that we will discuss in more detail next week did get. Mm. Although she didn't get the part, Dougie remembered her and Castro's Katarina when he had to fill that role. There were actually no plans to make Katarina a full-time companion. As it was felt that her character needed way too much to be explained to her. And the, you know, child from the past thing just wasn't going to fly. And there'll be too much of a burden in writing her character. I will get into my feelings on that later. Mm. But how's ever. That's why they had that deleted scene between Katarina and Vicky and the Myth Makers that I mentioned last week, where she described how an auger had predicted her death. They were kind of setting that up from her first moments. So based on what um, you said earlier on in this trivia section, was that scene scrapped for the fact that uh, Maureen was let go? No, that scene was scrapped because just timing they just didn't include it because of timing reasons. Okay. So, like, originally, like, the auger had predicted Katarina's death, which is why she keeps banging on about the fact, like, is this the underworld and where we're going to the afterlife or whatever. That's why she keeps going on about that, is because she was told that she was going to die. Okay. So they, they lobbied that up at the forefront, and that's why they had that scene with her and Vicky. But then the pacing of the Myth Makers wasn't working, so they pulled it. Weirdly enough, the first scene that she filmed for this story was actually her death scene, which is a depressing way to start filming. Yeah. Personally. Um, Although, it was her first time on a trampoline, and that was fun. They filmed it using a trampoline. She'd never been on one before. (laughs) I can imagine the direction of that, right? Jump, bounce, 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 and now you're in space. (laughs) (laughs) There is a short story that deals with Katarina, how to put it, it deals with her in the underworld after her death, which seems strange as a story for Doctor Who, which doesn't really explore the afterlife as a thing, do you know? Hmm. But there is a short story that is officially licensed, you know, it's a, you know, an official Doctor Who short story 
that looks at Katarina in the underworld and sees what happens to her soul after her death. Like, I suppose that if you think about it, back in the chase, they were exploring, they were potentially going to explore the concept of like an astral plane or a mindscape. So yeah. having like an afterlife or some sort of underworld, I, I'm pretty sure that they could have explained it in such a way that would would have made it kind of tie in with the universes were explained in Doctor Who, I think. I think they could have. I can understand why they didn't. At the time, yes. You know, Christianity. <laughs> you, know. you know, England is a predominantly Christian country. Mm. Church of England and all that. Mm-hmm. So I can understand why they veered away from that on screen. Yeah. But, like I said, there is a, an official story. I think now, is, now would have probably been a better time for them to actually do it because there's a lot more leeway in terms of portraying like religious iconography and religious afterlives on screen whereas back then it would have been a lot more restrictive i think yeah definitely adrian's on-screen acting credits are actually quite small um her imdb list is i think the shortest i have seen going through for this uh section so she was in compact 199 park lane and city life and that's it Kind of ironic that you're saying her acting credit's just small and the first one you call out is compact. (laughs) I suppose. However, she did, like I said, she was in theatre a lot. So there was that. And later in life, she became a drama teacher. So she did stay within the acting sphere. She just wasn't on screen as often. Adrian passed away back in 1997. Uh, One thing I'd as well, like I'd... We kind of mentioned, um, again, in admiration for the guys on Loose Cannon, the scene where Katarina's body is floating through space is actually quite fucking haunting. It is. That, that's fucked up. Yeah, because... I, I, I wasn't expecting to see that. Yeah, because it, it's like she's in the fetal position and she's just floating away from the ship as the doctor looks on and it's like, that's that's just... Fu- I, it's, I can see why Australia banned it, like, because we, we constantly talk about the whole thing of, you know, the kids hiding behind couches couches not couches couches due to like you know Daleks and other uh, famous villains but that's quite a harrowing scene to watch as a young child I think yeah it's well like that that's just the loose can rep- representation god knows what the actual thing would have yeah, looked like yeah fuck it like it's it's a lot I, I can understand it yeah I, and I'll, I'll get into more on how they did Katarina's death and, and what I feel about it when we're doing the character discussion but this is a dark first four episodes oh it's yeah it's incredibly dark like um as we said like you know even with um you know brett's death it's just yeah kind of cur- killed in cold blood and then at the, the the last line of the episode is like shoot for the head yeah but uh as you said more more trivia to go along with this not yeah like wow <laughs> that's just all i can say <laughs> <laughs> So for this week's character discussion, like we said, we will only be focusing on the characters as they appeared in the first four episodes, but we will follow our standard format. So doctor, companions and villains. So Paddy, I'll hand it over to you. What were your thoughts on the doctor in these first four episodes? Oh, you poor, 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 poor man. (laughs) It's like this is a very tough first part to the story for the doctor in the sense of like as like, no matter how far he travels no matter like what he sees and how much like you know debt he witnesses you're never really tr- ready for it when it hits home and like yeah. that's and that's what it is he obviously had it with Katarina and then in that exact same episode he sees it with Brett a, a man who he you know he's at you know odds with at times but they admit a mutual respect for each other and I think had he witnessed Brett's death, it would have been a lot more impactful rather than you know, Brett sacrificing himself for the two of them, you know? I But I think obviously he was, as well, I think he was more affected by Katarina's death than say if it had been Steve, if it had been Stephen who had died. I don't think he would have been as, been as affected by the death as it is with Katarina because due to her perception of life in the TARDIS, I think he feels a small bit more responsible for her 
in a sense he, like, yeah he I co- think there was a greater obligation of protection yeah than we have seen in may- with maybe any other companion other than Susan yeah because like up until this point in time we all we've seen is like contemporary modern day for the for like the time that the show was broadcast or companions that are from the future this yeah. would have been the first time that we have a companion that's from the past now it won't be the last time um but this is someone that's from the past and they're like again their perception of what what's around them is completely skewed by what they know in the world and there is like yeah that sense of like i need to protect this person until such a time as they're no longer I won't say naive, but uneducated to what mm. their what their new life is, and again, it's the tragedy of the missing episodes is that some of William Hartnell's best performances are probably missing yeah. because from the audio alone, like he's a the doctor is broken, he's momentarily broken by what he's just seen, and I think given the range of emotion and the range of like the kind of characteristics we've seen William Hartnell portray in the Doctor that would have been a really good scene to watch yeah I think for William Hartnell this is probably one of his best performances Mm, definitely like from the surviving footage and from the surviving audio I think Mm. this is definitely up there with his best performances what I liked about his interactions with Katarina is a, he's very nice. This complete fucking rando that he doesn't fucking know. <laughs> like, bear in mind, he'd never met her. She just turned up at the TARDIS helping Stephen. Mm. He had no idea who she was, and you know maybe Vicky had told him before she left. You know, I sent Katarina to get Stephen. You know, she thinks she's going to die. I think you should get her away from here. She's a nice girl or something like that. You know, we don't know because we didn't mm. get to fucking watch that conversation. <laughs> Not that I'm bitter. But he's very gentle with Mm. Katarina. He doesn't get frustrated with her. Like, we see Brett gets really frustrated with her later. Yeah. The doctor doesn't. He takes her very much under his wing. Now, I will say one thing. Right. You and I have discussed before how we disagreed with the way the first doctor was portrayed in Modern Who. Yes. I can kind of get a sense of that portrayal in the way he treats Katerina. Like he says repeatedly, you know, why can't you be like Katerina? She just does what she's told and doesn't ask questions. And out of context, I could see how that type of statement would lead to the first Doctor that we see in Modern Who. But see, th- this is the thing, right? Is that um, o- out of context, yes. But for the people that are writing the character, they clearly know the context in which the line is said. Yeah. But I'm, so, ju- I'm just saying, like, oh, for fans of New Who, who are kind of yeah. like, you know, this isn't really the way that he was described in mm. New Who. This, the way he interacts with Katarina, out of the context of where she's from, mm can come across as quite patronizing and very much do as you're told you know he never like says a bad word to her i don't think in the entire four episodes he never says anything negative to her no the worst he gets is when they leave the tardis but he's like what the (laughs) he's like what the fuck are you doing out here but then he's like you you know you couldn't have known that you were safe in there and there's no anger and there's no malice and there's no like you know evil yeah. you know evilness to it but I think that when I watched that bit with him say like why can't you be like Katarina and not ask questions I was like oh that's it's one of the little nuggets that they just plucked and yeah but see like th- th- again like I, th- I suppose it's the fact that after watching it for what are we on now we're on 21 this is story 21 after watching yeah. the preceding 20 stories I read it as a sort of um, why can't you be more like insert person here who doesn't you know act the bollocks essentially yeah so okay, we'll get to we'll get more to about Stephen and Brett yeah where again with additional context him being like just stop asking questions makes yeah. a way more sense yeah the one thing I will say is you know 
in the episode he's clearly devastated by what happened to Katarina. That like that's obvious. However, he does get back to his like Yoda like self fairly fucking quickly. Like he is devastated immediately after it happens. Mm. And he goes on about how she gave up her life for them, which I'll get to later. But literally in the next scene, he's doing his little Yoda laugh. And I kind of was like, that's that's in poor taste. Yeah. Who, whoever wrote, like, I don't know whether that was Terry writing that in the script or whether it was Dougie in the directing. But that was in poor taste, in my opinion. Yeah, because like, it's, it's a hallmark of the Doctor going forward. You know, the legacy of is that yeah. he can compartmentalize stuff quickly, but maybe not that quick. Yeah, I think that was a bit too quick for the way that she died as well. And his reaction. You know, I think he, that was a bit. Yeah. That was a bit much for me. And his reaction to it, absolutely. Like. Yeah. Overall, though, I think the Doctor in the story, I think it's probably one of his strongest. We get to see a nice range of his character. Mm. We also get to see him be very independent. Mm. You know, like we've sort of in previous stories relied on Stephen for the muscle and before that we relied on Ian. And in this story, we really kind of get to see that he's fine by himself for the most part. Yeah, because like... so he can handle himself. Because I think it was a thing in season two, all right, that he was a lot more like kind of independent of like the male companion, and it's like after Mitmakers, where it's like almost like he's dealing with a bully. Yeah, it's it's nice to kind of see him back dealing, being able to kind of go um, toe to toe in a battle of wits with his opponent, as opposed to having to deal with a thug, you know. Yeah, and we do see like the other bits of his character shining through. I mean, the whole the whole idea of we have to stop the Daleks. You know, again, he wouldn't have been like that way back at the beginning. No. In an earthly child, he wouldn't have given a monkey's bollocks. But also, like, he gets really angry with Brett for killing Brett's friend, whose name I've forgotten. But oh. he gets really angry with him yeah. for killing him outright. And Brett is like, well, he's a traitor. And the doctor's like, it doesn't, what have I told you? And you sort of get the sense that, like, even though Brett's only been with them for, like, two days, the way the doctor's like, what have I told you about life? What have I told you about killing? And you sort of get the sense that, like, he adopted Brett into their group really quickly, mm. given their rocky start, you know? And it's one of the things that I like about doctor i think that it was done really well in this I, story well i suppose it goes back to like the very first story um and an earthly child when he talks to barbara in the cave yeah and, like there's that sort of meeting the minds and it was like he think he says like fears fear makes friends of us all or something like that yeah, yeah. Uh, something something along that, that line yeah. that, that basically comes yeah so uh, yeah i think probably it's the concept shining true again yeah but no i think overall very powerful mm. first four episodes for the doctor yeah we'll have to see how he gets on in part two we will. So, moving on to our companions. So, I think we should do Stephen first. And then carry on to the people that don't make it to part two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we can decide which order we're going to do them when they come to them. Okay. So, Stephen. Stephanopoulos. Stephen, Stephen, Stephen. Uh, I'm not going to lie. I don't really have a whole lot to say about Stephen. Because he is a, he's a complete fifth wheel in, this, in these first four episodes. He really is. I am trying. Well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't quite say the fifth wheel, but like, he's the fourth wheel on a three wheel car. Do you know? Like, let's not get into semantics with the number of people there. <laughs> well, no, because it'll yeah. become a thing in a minute when yeah. we talk about Katarina. So yeah. I would say that he's the fourth wheel on a three wheel vehicle. Yeah. Um. Unnecessary, but okay. Um. My thing with Stephen. I'm trying. I am trying to like him. Peter Purvis has been part of like the Doctor Who family, you know, after he left the show for decades, mm. do you know. And I'm trying really hard to like his character, but I don't. I I don't like Stephen. He's so fucking annoying. Like, people give out about, like, oh, the classic companions, all they did was, like, scream for the doctor, like, referring to the women, like, yeah. all they did was scream and 
for the doctor and just get in the way or whatever. Jesus fucking Christ, Stephen. Doctor, can't we do anything? What exactly do you want to do while flying back to Earth? You're in a fucking spaceship, dumbass. What the hell do you think you can do between now and when you get to Earth? Like, and like use your fucking brain, Stephen. And do, do what's the kind of the tragedy about this, right? Is that in these first four episodes, he's kind of gone back to what he was like in The Time Meddler. I, 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 like, the Mitt Makers, I think, was Stephen's best performance to date. Yes. And. I agree. And now we've, we've kind of got a small bit of what happened with Susan in the sense of, you know, she had the sense rights, which, you know, was amazing. And then we go into Reign of Terror, which, you know, she's losing the will to carry on. As like with Stephen, it's like we had, you know, yeah, I can see you giggling at that reference. Um, she's lost the will to, to live. live. <laughs> What's your degree in poetry? <laughs> um, whereas here, like, you know, we had like that really strong performance in The Myth Makers. And now it's like he just faded back into the shadows. And... I don't know whether like that was as we kind of mentioned there about uh, the doctor's quick change of mood. Is that down to the writing to kind of showcase, you know, to build up these characters that are going to die so that the emotional punches there a small bit more, or is it that that's how the character was just handled anyway, irregardless of what would what would have occurred the you know in the four episodes. Um, all I can say is that hopefully part two brings along something better. But part one is a giant step. Uh, the first quarter or first third, sorry, my maths, uh, of this story, it's a step back for Steve. Yeah, like, at the start, you kind of feel bad for him. Like, do you know what I mean? And Peter does do the whole Stephen being very unwell. Hmm. Stephen is very, very not good <laughs> at the start <laughs> of this story. But as soon as he starts recovering, it's this abrasiveness that just won't fuck off. And his quick to violence again, which it helps out from time to time. But I think the bit I don't like about Stephen in comparison to Ian and even in comparison to Brett, who I'll get on to later, is that Stephen's quick to violence comes from, in my mind, a negative place. Hmm. He's just that way anyway. You know, he's a very abrasive person and that comes out in him being very quick to violence. Whereas with Ian, it was a protective thing. Mm. Always a protective thing with Ian. And with Brett, it's militaristic. It's training. It's This is his job. With Stephen, it's you've pissed me off for some minor fucking reason. So I'm going to chase you down and jump on you. I have no fucking clue who you are. Yeah. Like, Bre- Bre- I'm hoping he gets better. I'm hoping he gets better because I, I really, really, really want to like him. Like, At the moment, I really, really don't. Brett reminds me of Mark Corey from Mission to the Unknown. In the sense, like, and obviously, yeah. like, you know, they're, they're looking for Corey, so maybe they're just, you know, they're good friends. But uh, Stephen, just the way you're saying about his, like, kind of mentality, it reminds me of um, the Wild Wild West. And he just, like, you know, your approach of, you know, shoot first, shoot again, shoot some more. Then once everyone's dead, ask, try and ask a question. <laughs> just that sort of thing. That is pretty much Stephen in a nutshell. And, like, <laughs> I've excused it up to now because, like, oh, is this, like, his sort of PTSD from being on Mechanist? But they never mention Mechanist again. No. So you can't use that as an excuse. If you're going to have that be part of his character, then someone has to call him on his bullshit. If no one's calling him on it, then it means that you think that's a perfectly acceptable way for the character to be. Yeah. Which but, I would disagree with. Like, his his arc from the chase up through till now was, like, on that trajectory of someone that is learning as they go. Because, like, in The Time Meddler, I, like, he's, he's an idiot. He's Leroy Jenkins. <laughs> Um, in uh, Galaxy 4 he's annoying but at least he's taking on more of the ideals of uh, Vicky and the Doctor Yeah. and then the Mitt Maker is like, you know, it's his best performance today like, he's intelligent he's you know uh, intelligent he's strong he's actually kind of putting into the, the action man type of role uh, the protected role and now in these first four episodes he's got as you said like he's just kind of gone back so we'll see where where it lands us. Yeah. So, onto the 
Katarina and Brett scenario. Now, do you want to do the officially recognized companion first, or do you want to do uh, Brett first? We'll do Brett first, and I will start off with why the fuck is Brett not considered a companion, but Katarina is? Um, the only thing that I can think of is that Kat- <laughs> this is going to sound weird now, right? But because Katarina carried over from a, no- a previous story, is she considered to be a companion? I don't know, but like I would, because because like you know, as like we know, and like our listeners will grow to know as, grow to know as well, is that there's a huge debate over whether certain character recurring characters in the show are considered to be companions or not. Uh, like you know, we have the likes of Unit uh, that will come down the line, and just like you know, and even like some people that recognize companions they're argued against them like again like I, was, I saw a recent thread there on our on the fan page that we're both part of uh doctor who or the fan page for uh was it i can't never remember the actual full name of it the doctor who for people who are actually fans, actually fans of, of doctor oh yeah that's the one as to whether liz shaw a much later companion is actually considered to be a companion so it, it, it's it's really weird it's yeah really... like is it because katarina went in the tardis and brett didn't I don't know. Possibly. Anyway, right. Point is, I liked Brett. Brett yeah. was cool. Brett was also played by a cool person, which makes him even more cool. Yeah. <laughs> I think Brett was a great character. Hmm. I think, you know, with Corey last week, or two weeks ago, rather, his sort of duplicity, like, he kind of went undercover on this other ship, and then all that crew died little bit of a dick move mm. do you know here we see that you know he could have gone on his own ship you know <laughs> <laughs> and done the job you know officially as opposed to doing all the secret shit but you know we see a lot of quarry in brett you know a lot of that like i said that military training reaction mm. and you know at, uh, at one point i've written down here like i'm like two like bullet points back to back it was like don't kill the doctor for a key. Like, what the hell? And then, Bold Brett is very bold. Yeah. <laughs> because Bold Brett was lying to Katarina, and that was that was naughty. But he's not a bad guy. Do you know? No, he's... like I think this is the sort of thing where, kind of like Corey in, in one regards, is that they can be viewed to be bad guys due to the necessity of the situation that they're in. Yeah, it's like uh, the way I kind of view it is that Brett and Corey and other members of the space security service, lads, you need a better title for them. Uh, they're essentially the double O agents from the James Bond franchise. Yeah, and like you know, like, yeah, they're, they're you know they're charming, they're suave, but at the same time, they are licensed to kill and they do kill. So yeah, but I think you know, ultimately, we see that Brett is a nice guy. In his first episode, you know, he's tied up to <laughs> this chair that he can't get out of. <laughs> and he's just watching Katarina fret over Stephen and he's just like, what's wrong with him? Okay. There's tablets in my pocket. He can, he can have some. No, seriously. No, no, listen. No, really. They're in, they're in my pocket. So just, just, give, just give him the tablets and he'll be better again. And that's the thing, like you're waiting for the other like, shoe to drop you're waiting for him to kind of put the gun to Katarina's head or whatever the case is and it never comes about no you're yeah. waiting for him to be like here you know take them from my pocket and then convince her to release him from the chair do you know and she doesn't do that and yeah she releases him later and it was at Brett's urging but Brett didn't know that the TARDIS was impenetrable hmm. and so again he tried to save them by saying get me the fuck out of the chair hmm we need to leave. Do you know? And it's very much so. I would have been very interested to see his conversation with the doctor before he took the key. Because yes. it, it sort of begs the question of why he took the key and was lying about the doctor when he's a really nice guy. Uh, it's like, that's... I, I just had this funny image of them both holding the key and it's like, just like, stop, stop. You know, they're just trying to slap each other's hands away. Just... Yeah. <laughs> also, the one the one bit of his military training that clearly like mm. shot over Brett's head was you have stolen a key to get into a thing. Don't leave the fucking key in the door, dumbass. Yeah. <laughs> I, that that's the one thing I could never I was like going, right, highly skilled operative. 
nope. <laughs> just <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, when you compare it with Nick Courtney's future character, yeah, it kind of makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Not that but that it... other character isn't like completely capable, but just it it it. It, it's it's totally something that would happen to a Nick Courtney character. Yeah. Um. But like, the I, one thing I, no, about don't. sorry, the one thing about Brett with the whole like him being a nice guy is that it might seem incredibly cruel that he was planning on leaving the Doctor hmm. and leaving in the, in the ship with Katarina and Stephen, and like Stephen fucking loses his mind because of course he does because Stephen is indignant about everything. But the thing with Brett is that Brett isn't a sentimental person. You no. know, they need to get off this planet. They need to warn Earth. And the doctor told them to leave. And Brett recognizes that as be it an order, you're know, from a superior, or, you know, a mission commander making a choice and you have to obey the mission commander. He said to leave him behind. So we fucking leave him behind and we do the mission. It's very much um, the needs of the many, Jim, outweigh the needs of the few. <laughs> yeah. It's also. He told us to leave. Yeah. And it's important that we leave. I am not risking the entire human race. And that, because that, he may the, have only half meant it. No, it's, like, it's, like, it's the entire solar system. Like, and that, that's not just like the human race. It's like whatever life was like, you know, on Venus and Mars and everything. Yeah. Like, so that's the, that, I think that's the one thing that Doctor Who and other franchises have done like, really well is that they've kind of pushed beyond the scope of just the human race and they've included everything else and that the bigger the the bigger the scope of you know the 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 death count the more kind of harsh actions you have to take so again like yeah i think brett is one of those you know he's a soldier first and foremost and he has to follow you know the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few i can't stop what i'm doing for one old man when i have trillions upon trillions of lives to save yeah, and, you know, going back to his military training, that actually comes full circle with Brett's death. Yes. You know, I mentioned in the Doctor piece that, you know, the Doctor got really angry with Brett because Brett just shot the... Your man. Your man, the, his friend or whatever. Just shot him outright when he realised that he was a traitor. Yeah. But then the exact same thing happens to Brett when Sarah kills him at the end yeah you know there's no chance to explain it's you're a fucking traitor you're dead and it's something that like this like space security service or whatever they need to work on their shoot first ask fucking questions later thing because Corey was exactly the same <laughs> it's very consistent <laughs> mm. across their training which is kill the thing it's like well Sometimes don't kill the thing because otherwise you can't get answers. Uh, so will we move on to Katarina? Yeah, I am not going to lie. Mm-hmm. I didn't like her. <laughs> I didn't like her at all. Um, and I don't know. Like, if Brett doesn't count as a companion, I don't see why Katarina does. And again, it's the. Um, the, it's the mentality of like you know what constitutes a companion. Is it yeah. is it is it is there an episode quota? In which case, I think Brett has more than reached it because he survived for four episodes. Um, is it a traveling with the guys quota? Well, then okay, fair enough. Then she has the up on that because she was in the TARDIS and they never traveled. But Brett her. also traveled on a ship with them. But not the TARDIS. That's the thing. Then that's why Liz gets disqualified. Yeah. But Liz is counted as a com- as a companion, like so. It's it it's up in the air. Um, I I think I'm probably going to disagree with you about Katarina, uh, but I'll let okay. you fi- I'll let you finish any other thoughts that you have on her, and then I'll go on to my thing. Okay, so so why don't I like her? Oh. I get what they were trying to do. Hmm. Right, she yeah. is someone from ancient Earth. Who doesn't understand what's going on around her? And you know, I said in the trivia that you know, she was never intended to be a full time companion because they felt it would have been too much of a chore to explain everything to her. That's no excuse for the horrible writing that they did around her character. Like you can do child out of time, person out of time story, hmm. way fucking better than they did in this. Like 
not only is she naive, she's also kind of dumb. Like, just in general. And, like, you know, I was saying that, you know, Stephen's like the fourth wheel on a three-wheel vehicle. Katarina is the fifth wheel. Oh, okay. But the majority of the story, it's, you know, the three lads off making decisions and doing things. And Katarina is a fucking ornament off to the side. She says nothing. She doesn't ask questions. She just stands there. Makes, oh my god, I'm scared face. And then gets sucked into the vastness of space. And following on from the amazing female companions we had up to now. Hmm. Like Susan, yeah, she had her down points. But her up points were really high up. Yeah. Barbara is a goddess and Hmm. always will be. And Vicky was, you know, a young, intelligent, you know, independent, free-thinking child who, you know, was able to take care of herself. When you compare Katarina to that, I mean, I get that they wanted to do, she doesn't understand the technology, but like, you know, oh, there's tablets in my pocket. Cool, she takes out the thing. He doesn't tell her that's the wrong one. And she's like, are these tablets? It's like, well, obviously they are, or he would have told you you grabbed the wrong fucking thing out of his pocket. Like, the writing that they give her, it's not just naivety. It becomes dumb. Which makes her very fucking annoying. I'll get to the bit, you know, we'll talk about her death in a second, once you've had your, your overview, but, like, the other thing there, that this is where I think her writing is badly done. So she still believes they're on their way to the underworld. Mm. Okay? So she believes the Doctor is a god. The TARDIS is a temple. She is on her way to the underworld because she was told she was going to die. If she believes they're dead, why is she trying to make Stephen better? I actually never thought of that. They're dead. Why is she trying to make him better? If you account for the fact that, like, oh, she's trying to ease his passing into the underworld, well, he's dead, Katarina. So when he gets to, I mean, we're talking Greek history here, right? Mm -hmm. So he's either going to go to Tartarus, highly unlikely, he's going to go to the fields of Elysium, in which case they'll make him better. Or he's going to go to the other one, which I forgot the name of. Asphodel, is it? Yeah. And it's like, which is limbo. Okay, maybe if he goes there, he might. But like, that's not the way their depiction of the afterlife works. You know, except maybe if he was going to Tartarus. But if he was going to Tartarus, why would she try to make him better anyway? Because he deserves to go to Tartarus. So... (laughs) That's where I say like that they were trying to do all these things to make her this like oh my god like she's from Troy and blah blah blah, blah. but it just makes her fucking annoying and dumb. Mm. There's a difference between culturally and technologically naive and dumb. And like, even Brett calls her on it later and is like, "What the fuck is up with her?" <laughs> and Steve's like, "Oh, she's from Troy. It's fine." And Brett's is like, "No, just fucking." What the fuck? So that I, I I don't like her. I'm sorry. Like I I really don't. Uh, cool. So I think the reasons why I disagree with you, uh, to for like for some parts of it is that, like one, I was getting the kind of a my fair lady vibe between like her interactions with the doctor, in the sense of, you can see where I'm coming from with that. And yeah, then, you know, okay. she she's the uncultured person. He's like trying to, he's doing his best. Like he's showing a lot more patience than. He would have before he ever met Barbara and Ian, you know. Yeah. But she, like, and obviously, like you know, we were having this discussion now about like you know whether is she actually a companion or is she not a companion, and like her short tenure on it doesn't really help clear up that side of things. Um. Now I'll be honest. I've always been kind of, you know, a fan of the concept of bringing someone out of the past into a future setting to see how they get on. Uh, it's done in Doctor Who to like great effect. It's done in some great movies, such as like you know in uh, California Man. It's great, <laughs> um, um, but like I would have liked to have seen another adventure, or to see have something to see what she would what she would have been like 
because when you're introduced for someone and all they end up doing is like at the end dying it's I think it's tough like to kind of get them into like a uh, like maybe like a full scope like do they have a lot more kind of strengths that they weren't characterized because they were only just writing the person to die um but one thing I will kind of say is that like her 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 death and the whole thing is like you know she she was told that she was going to die and she doesn't know how it's going to happen or what action she's going to take so I think her sacrificing herself for the greater good because clearly like you know the guys are being held hostage by their indecision over what to do so she just decides to you know work the airlock and take herself out of the equation with your man I kind of view that as a, a very strong action by someone I get that and you and I discussed this a little bit because as I was watching this I was like holy <laughs> shit they shot her out of an airlock because yeah. again I knew she didn't survive the story yeah I didn't fucking know what happened to her because I deliberately didn't look it up I because not this is no fault to the guys at loose cannon right but because the entire reconstruction the entire episode doesn't survive right mm. it's bits and pieces but the way they portrayed her up to now i know the doctor says she sacrificed herself for us she was trying to save us whatever i for all i know the dumb bitch did it by accident and she thought she was pressing the button to let them back in but see the thing is like, I, she knows how to kind of operate the airlock because when she was keeping guard um you know as they were trying to repair the ship for takeoff she was shown like how things work and she went back to ensure that the airlock was closed so i'd say she has rudimentary understanding of how it works i i would i would say that it was on purpose what she did as opposed to accidental yeah i i don't know it's just because of the way i perceived her character up until that point um it just came across as the dumb bitch fucking ejector, ejected herself into space. Now, I have a question. Or that, you know, did did she fully understand what would happen when she pushed that other button? I mean, does anyone explain to her what an airlock does? Um, I Well, obviously, um, she was paying attention. Like, does she have any concept of the fact that there's no air in space? No, that I don't know. But what I, I'd say she does have a concept of the fact that without the air, with, if the airlock is open bad thing bad things will happen because well she knows if the airlock is open the ship can't take off but that's about all she knows mm. but like see yeah it's again i think it's a it's a tough it's a tough thing to call because yeah. like we're, we're now again we're, we're here like having this discussion like you're kind of saying that she's on the dumb side of things i'm kind of saying that she's on the strong side side the action of it but again because we've only had such a limited interaction with this character it's really hard to get a complete read over motivations and thought processes. Like, like I, I, I can see Vicky doing that, not like at the drop of a hat. Like, I can understand her motivations for doing it. Yeah. And again, right, if they had removed the fact that she keeps saying, how can we go back to Earth? We're on our way to the underworld. Like, if they had removed the fact that she believed they were dead. Hmm. So if she believed the doctor that he wasn't a god, this wasn't a temple, and she wasn't dead then I would see it more so of her accepting her destiny that the auger told her and killing herself. Mm. But she already thinks they're dead. Deader. So why kill herself again? Um, maybe it's the thing of, um, what is it? What if we're in your, like, we have a chance of escaping the underworld, whereas this, it's completely gone. Dead, dead. Yeah, I... No, I I, th- I think that's the one. I think that's the one thing that makes it unbelievable for me, and that that makes her entire character unbelievable is that they continue with this belief that she thinks they're dead, and that ruins the believability as the character because that just makes her dumb. Right. Because people have explained to her a million times over, you're not fucking dead. Stephen is sick. We're being shot at. You know, this is by no means any depiction of the underworld you've ever fucking heard of. You know, someone is trying to strangle you in an airlock. You know, you're not dead. And she doesn't believe it. And that, to me, is a... It's a disservice to the character. Do you know? Hmm. They, they they chose that particular path line badly. And it would have been quite interesting to see a character from that time learning and growing and, like, even at one point, you know, like the doctor comes back in and Brett's like, oh, did you close the airlock? 
and the doctor's like no no obviously it sets up the guy that crapped on board but you know been great if katarina went oh i did mm. to show that she was learning and to show that she was getting to grips with it but they don't do that I, th- so. I think one more story uh like in the interim probably would have helped build the character up a small bit more now i have a question for you yeah. based on this yeah who do you like less steven or katarina It's still Stephen. <laughs> I knew it. Katarina, I knew it. Katarina didn't have long enough. <laughs> Stephen's been bothering me for weeks. Oh, uh, so how about we get on? We, like we we suit ourselves now with talking about the villains of the piece. Someone that we can both be angry at. Yeah. So our villains. We have the Daleks. Mm. Obviously, we have Mavic Chen. Yep. And then there's the delegates who again. If we start with the delegates, similar to the missions going on, I don't have a whole lot about the delegates here. Cool. Um, I do still find it really funny that like they're all dressed up in whatever way they can make them look alien, mm-hmm. and they're all trying to do their own unique walking <laughs> style to make themselves more alien. It was really funny to watch them all parade into the meeting hall, and each mm-hmm. of them doing their own like different. You know, one of them is kind of like floaty, yeah. and a lot of them are very kind of blocky, and I'm like. Oh, look at you all trying to make up alien walks. You can tell by the way I use my walk. I'm a woman's man. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my only note on the delegates is like, all right, lads, whip them out and see who's bigger. Because, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's all, you know, that's all it is. The backstabbing is to be expected. You know, that's, you know. Oh, like, there's like such an amount of dick measuring in this. Uh, it's crazy. But also, they are also dumb as fuck. Oh, yeah. Right, so I... I jokingly mentioned the way all the actors were trying to make the movements of their alien character unique. But the character that the Doctor impersonates... Mm, Zephon, yeah. ...always walks with his hands out. So, like, every time we see him walking, he walks with his hands out of his sides. So you can see his little, like, leafy, leafy hands, or whatever kind of hands he had. Yeah. And yet when the Doctor's impersonating him, he has his hands hidden the entire time. Because obviously he doesn't have weird leafy hands. Hmm. And when all the delegates are banging the table, he doesn't bang the table and he doesn't clap. And I'm like, that way of walking, that's the way that guy walks. Did you not fucking notice that like he's suddenly walking really different after being late to the meeting? Like, is no one <laughs> suspicious of that at all? Uh it just reminds me of like a kind of a Blazing Saddles reference, you know. Was it? I didn't get a harumph out of that guy. Give, give the Dalek harumph, harumph. Yeah, so they're delegates at a war conference. They're going to be one upping each other, mm. and they're dumb as fuck. Uh, it'd be interesting to see how their story plays out over the next uh, eight episodes. Yeah, I'm. I don't have high hopes for them. I'll be honest. <laughs> uh. oh, they're. They're dumb as fuck. So how about Mavic Chen? Guardian of the solar system, my fucking ass. Like, what a weird character. Also, man never went to school. Because his writing? Like, your well, daughter can do better than that. Well, see, that's the thing. Like, because like, he's, he grasps the pen really weirdly. He puts it, like, over his yeah. middle and ring finger... But then holds it in place with his index and pinky. Yeah. And I was like, does does that actor have like you know kind of a, a hand deformity? In which case, like, would they not have just you know shot the scene above where his hand is writing, like they do for like James Doohan and Gary Burgoff in Mash and Star Trek? But like, it it was just, or are you just trying to make him really unique with a weird handwriting? Yeah, but it's like you know, it's meant to be like, oh, he's writing notes the whole time. It's meant to be he's kind of hmm. pious is the wrong word, but you know what I mean. He's he's sort of meant to be you know the delegate who knows what he's doing you know and he thinks very highly of himself and then you look at what he's doing and it's literally squiggles that squiggle over themselves it's <laughs> literally like the way you would if you were pretending to take notes mm. and you just do squiggly line squiggly line <laughs> squiggly line now no one can read my super secret code yeah but like it's not like this is like some weird futuristic way of writing because Susan could fucking write like a normal person yep. ish do you know <laughs> but this is just wavy line um, wavy line 
left or right. I was like, what the fuck? Um, his nails are also very fucking distracting. Yeah, they're they're, they're that old kind of Oriental style, right to the point. Like you'd see it in a lot of kind of old movies based in uh, ancient China. Yeah, but also like he's constantly like touching his face. Hmm. And I don't know whether it's a COVID thing. I'm very aware of people <laughs> touching their face. <laughs> but it's kind of, it's like, you can't not look at his nails. Yeah. Um, and the last thing I have about Mavic... Basically, he's a dick, is, is my other point. But the last thing I have about him is like, what story did he tell people to make people believe Brett was a traitor? Well, see, this is the thing now, right? Is that I kind of characterize... In this first part, anyway, I characterize Mavic Chen as like the space version of Littlefinger. Yeah, and you know we're told constantly like you know that Mavic Chen like you know he's the the because the guys are uh, tuning into his broadcast to say I'm going on holidays. I mean like for fuck's sake like no politician in the world go has a preference to say I'm going on holidays. It's just that he just goes or they or they just go. So clearly this guy has got like an awful lot of clout that everyone was like oh my god oh my god is he where's he going I think Tenerife <laughs> that that type of fucking thing. Um, so. I would say that he's got enough kind of faith in his or his people have enough faith in him that if he says someone is a traitor cool this guy's a traitor yeah but like he mentions the fact that Brett is working with the Daleks and he mentions the fact that Brett went to Campbell Mm. I was like how the fuck does he know all that like (laughs) there's not there's 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 like obeying your leader Mm. and there's He's saying that Brett was on Campbell and Brett has this really rare mineral and Brett's siding with the Daleks but Brett went to Campbell to find the guy who went missing. Or did he? How the fuck... Why was Mavic Chen on Campbell? He went on holidays to Campbell? Well, like, maybe... See this thing? Maybe, um... Because uh, the head of the security service, Carlton, is in league with him. So like maybe they could have cooked up a story together that Kurt was uh, killed by Brett and like maybe Kurt was spying on Brett. Maybe I would just love I would love to have heard whatever this fucking story he told was mm. because, like, like th- these people clearly like love him. Yeah, which is fine, you know, within the context of the story. But like, they turn on Brett super fucking quick. Oh yeah, but then again, like Brett is just a nameless scrub. Like he's just an agent. He like he's. Like, yes, Brett has commendations, but he's no different than any other, like you know, decorated officer in any army throughout the world. You know. Yeah, but like, isn't but like they knew that Brett was going searching for their missing guy. It was a fully sanctioned mission. So to then say that he was a traitor was like, what sort of weird fucking leap of logic did you present to them on that one? Who knows? Like again, again, I think yeah. Like as you kind of pointed out, there are a couple of script uh, <laughs> issues. Terry, like no, that's the thing. Like you wonder if like it was Terry who like like the previous uh, three Dalek stories have been incredibly strong in terms of like uh, the plot points. Mm. Uh, so like I think maybe there might be a bit more influence in this one than just Terry. Uh, but the other thing I was going to say about Mavic Chen before we move on to the the big bads is that I kind of wonder like does he know how dangerous the game he is uh, he's playing with the Daleks? Like does he actually think that he's smarter than them and he can get the one up on them? Or is he actually fully aware of what the Daleks are capable of and is just trying to get as much of a reward as he possibly can from them? I think in that reign, he's the same as the other fucking delegates. He thinks he can go toe-to-toe with them Mm. and that he's on the same playing field as them. And I suppose as we kind of said before uh, in Mission is that maybe it's with like obviously a small bit of... um, Oh, I can't think of the word right now but it's warranted seeing so the fact that you have the Daleks requesting an alliance with all these other galaxies to invade the the Sol system but it, it'll, it'll just be interesting to see like you know how, when their realisation comes about and how their realisation comes about yeah so we move on to our big bad mm-hmm. the Daleks themselves yep so do you want to go first or will I go first or watch the you can go first cool um, so Hey, look, it's Daleks being Daleks. Like, what more can we say? Like, we've we've firmly established how much of a threat that they are, and again, we firmly established like that, that despite their, again, upon first viewing, silly looking design, 
the more the more you watch it, the more like you know, the more you see the Daleks, the more you realize that yeah, you know what, they're actually not quite that silly. They're quite fucking in- intimidating, intense, and terrifying. Um, one thing that I love is we're getting a much more uh, in depth view into how their society works, like to the structure of what Daleks are like. So mm. we've got the Dalek Supreme in this, and you know, it's all powers of the Dalek Supreme. And he is fucking ruthless. R- yes. Ruthless in the sense of, yeah, lads, come on away home there now and off to the side, kill those useless pricks. Yeah. That was something I wasn't really expecting the Daleks to say. Yeah, and it's it's not Do even you like, you know, like, okay, like, you know, they failed in their mission, kill them. It's you can come home now, you know, prepare to be debriefed, and then it's like that that's cold. <laughs> Yeah, that's that that is taking things to a whole new level. The thing with the Daleks is that, you know, I said it in Mission to the Unknown, they're planning on killing the delegates. I mean Oh, absolutely. Duh. Though. Like <laughs> it, it it's like the Dalek superiority complex is that they, they need no one. They don't need allies. Yeah. But cannon fodder is pretty good. Yeah. The one the one thing that actually freaked the shit out of me in this episode and you know it's a interesting thing is the whole time they were mentioning it, I was like, what the fuck does that even do? What are they on about? They were talking about the randomizer, the randomizer, the randomizer, the randomizer. Holy fuck, the randomizer's scary as hell. So they can just take control of your ship mm-hmm. and direct it where they want to go. Can you imagine driving your car? Well, you can you drive, imagine driving my car? <laughs> <laughs> Smooth. <laughs> can you imagine driving a car and suddenly you lose all con- all control and it's not like that the car's electricals have cut out you know which you know mm. unfortunately does happen in cars someone else has control of the car and you cannot see them you don't know where they're taking you that is scary as fuck I'm afraid I can't allow that Patty yeah th- no like that is no I yeah that's fucked up and especially when you're the planet you're about to land on is a fucking penal world yeah it's like i think of all the sort of like you know random dalek tech that we've seen so like the robo men yeah wasn't a big fan of them you know the doctor duplicate thing was cool i wouldn't have called it scary maybe if we'd seen more of it mm. but this I don't, I, I don't know why this freaked the shit out of me this idea of someone taking control of your ship from so far away do you know and like they don't have they don't have a relay mechanism on it Hmm. do you know it's not like that they had a piece of machinery in chen's ship to allow them to control it they'd never seen chen's ship before yeah they can control any ship that's freaky we'll have to see if it comes into play again so an interesting character discussion to say the Mm -hmm. least Uh, i think it's the first time you and i have disagreed so wholeheartedly on a character (laughs) (laughs) or at least so no that that, that's not true marco polo we disagreed on marco polo yeah yeah, okay Uh, companion yeah companion yeah. <laughs> so, what were your overall thoughts on these first four episodes? So, this is my second time watching the, these first four episodes, and the first time around, I, I, I wasn't really hugely engaged in it um, as such because like I'd heard, you know, about Katerina and Katerina was dying. So, I think I was watching it just to get to the point where Katerina was dying. Mm. Uh, plus, like I think. Um, I was having maybe a small bit of issues reconciling Nick Courtney as Brett versus Nick Courtney as how I knew him. Mm. <laughs> um, but what I will say is that second time around that the story is, I think is a lot more engaging. Like whatever about some of the character actions in it, the the, the plot of the story I think is quite engaging. And it's like the fact that it went out for 12 episodes I'm hoping to see that same level of engagement the entire way through all 12 because 12 is it's a slog yeah like uh, because up until now we've only done 7 
and we've seen the various ways that se- like you know seven episodes can be played out but 12 is a completely different beast so i think terry has his work cut out for him to keep an audience engaged yeah i think for the opening four episodes of like this like epic 12 part mm. i think it was good i was engaged with the story it tied up very well from mission to the unknown and that through line works mm. very very well um, it has a couple of things i don't like katarina being one of them I, I, the way they decided to run with the katarina character being one of them mm. let's let's be fair right um at several points in time it's too many men trying to take the lead and poor katarina just following along like a puppy not knowing what to do um and at one point actually at several points it really devolves into you shut up no you shut up no you shut up no you shut up no i know what to do and it's like oh fuck off guys seriously Mm. it is an interesting story though and they didn't pull their punches with how dark a story like that can get do you Mm. know you have a space security agency that we have established has a license to kill we have the daleks who we have established are like the most fearsome enemy and so two companions died Mm. you know in one in the most horrific fucking way we've seen a character die on screen in doctor who up to now i don't think there's anything been anything more horrific than being sucked into the vacuum of space no and that's scary as fuck i mean this show is on saturday evenings it's meant to be family viewing Hmm. and you sucked a fucking character into space like that's scary as shit like so i'm really interested to see how it's going to resolve itself and i'm also really interested because this is the first time that they've been on a different planet or at least in a different planetary orbit than the tardis they are fucking, like, they're nowhere near it. Do you know, the closest thing would have been, like, in the sensorites, where they were on the on the sense sphere and the TARDIS yeah. was up in, in the ship. But they had an easy way to go to both places. They have now fucked off to the middle of nowhere. Maybe Keys of Marinus, you know, when they kept having to jump across all the planet. But they were still on the planet. They were yeah. on the same planet. Oh, they're not oh, on yeah, the same yeah, planet yeah. anymore. <laughs> oh, yeah, so it's like completely separate to where it is, yeah. Yeah, yes. because... They're going to have to go back to Campbell. Yeah. If for no other reason than they need to get the TARDIS back. <laughs> uh, well, will they get the TARDIS back? Who knows? I, I think I would feel safe in placing a bet that they're going to get the TARDIS back. <laughs> I, I would feel confident in that. Cool. Anything else you want to add? No, I think that's pretty much it until next week. Yeah, so... We come to the end of our discussion of the first four episodes of the Daleks Master Plan. Mm -hmm. So guys, join us next week when we'll be finishing the story and giving our overall score. Bye-bye. Bye for now.